Hey everyone, John Vance here with some exciting news that you definitely don't want to miss. You know how we're always looking for ways to improve, whether it's mastering incident command or leveling up as fire officers. Well, B-Shifter has teamed up with Waldorf University to offer you a unique opportunity to advance your career in fire science administration. This new partnership means you can now transfer your blue card certifications toward earning a degree from Waldorf University. That's right. Your training with Blue Card can fast track you to a bachelor's degree in fire science with Waldorf offering up to 75 percent of transferable credits. Whether you're looking to take on a leadership role, build your skills or move up the ranks, this partnership can help make that happen. And here's the kicker. Blue Card students, staff, and their families get a 10% tuition discount, and the application fee is completely waived. Waldorf University is known for its flexible online programs, so you can keep serving your community while you study on your terms. So what are you waiting for? Head over to waldorf.edu slash blue card today, send in that free application, and take your next step in advancing your fire service career. We'll see you at the top, B-Shifters. So it's like the question the other day about the, uh, we're talking about the OSHA thing and, and small versus big yeah. departments. And you're like, well, no, you're, you're there, oh, I'm a volunteer. I can't do this. So the volunteer fire service will go away. You think, well, maybe they should. If, if they can't do this form of training, they shouldn't be firefighters. You know, it's such an opportunity for fire chiefs when OSHA came out with that to go to their mm-hmm. elected officials and say, hey, here it is. Now yeah. Let's do it. I've been telling you this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. This justifies everything I've been asking for. Well, we had one of those. I was telling you, Kevin Roach came in and did a work study for us and mm-hmm. justified everything. City manager says, nah, I don't really buy that. Yeah. Uh-huh. He took the book and threw it over there and never showed it to the politicians. Well, that's why if, if you can get the council to adopt a service level objective for the fire department where you spell out what the effective response force should be, both for structure, fire, medical call, everything, and the and the intended result, like you were saying on our last podcast, where you know, do you want do you want to hold the fire to the room of origin, the building of origin, or the block of origin? What's the council going to say? Yeah, they want the room of origin, right? Well, so yeah, when mm-hmm. I was in Glendale, they, but oh, they want to pay for the block of origin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can't have it both ways. A couple years when I was in Glendale, he was trying to get that staffing, trying to get that staffing. I went through, found an old document from. From a previous council that was called, uh, shit, I can't remember what it's called, City something, City Scope or whatever. And it said right in the document they adopted that they wouldn't decrease service levels in the fire service. And it, so when I pulled that out, threw it on his desk, oh, he got so, it was part of that document I put together. Mm-hmm. And I said, here you go. If the city adopted this level of service, you can't, as a city manager, you can't just decide to do that. Man, his I could just see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He didn't even know that document existed. No, he, they have their own agenda. All of them do. Every single one of them. That's when he was done with me. Yeah. It's like, well, no, I'm going to have to fight with you. And now I'm not going to be able to get the, well, just the fact that you agree to be part of the automatic aid consortium, you have to have four person staffing. You can't go back. He didn't like that. Yeah, well, it's a, that's the whole thing. Well, no, I can't manage the way I need to. Well, th- that's that's why they wrote all this, so you can't manage the way you want to. Yeah. yeah. In the year 2024, there should not be new fire departments popping up. And I, and, I'm, and, and it's a trend right now, and I think it's part of the political mm-hmm. bullshit that's going on. But yeah. the trend is people are breaking out of fire districts and, and like, contracts and starting their own fire department because they believe they can do it cheaper, which and they really can't. I mean— the end of the day, you can't. I mean, it's it's way so expensive. It's a consumer department. It takes yeah. a lot of money, man. Yeah. Oop, there's a sound. Well, we have a question. Let's get to this question. See if we can answer this. <clears throat> okay. So, um, and I'm not. This this uh, guy Gabe wrote into us. He's 23 years old, 
and a firefighter. He's a seasonal wildland firefighter. He's completing college. He wants to be somewhere that's progressive, that uses blue card, that looks at the customer the way that we talk about here on P Shifter. Um, and he wants some advice from us. How, how can it, cause he's, he's finding places that really aren't that progressive and don't really have the same values as he does and wants to have as a, as a blossoming firefighter. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like his heart's in a good place, but he's having trouble finding a place where he really wants to land. So what, what mm -hmm. advice do we have for Gabe? Nick, um, <laughs> I was looking at a document the other day. How many blue card fire departments are there now? 3,000. 3,300, yeah. Yeah, something like that. Right, right, 3,300 yeah. fire departments have practiced blue card. Um, there's a start. But, you know, yeah. it's interesting. And, you know, everything you said about Gabe there, 23 years old, wants to do a good job, wants to work for a good department, which really everybody mm -hmm. does when they're starting off. Nobody wants to work for assholes, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, he's he asked us about it thinking we might have some insight <laughs> on that. First of all, we were extremely blessed, privileged, lucky, whatever you want to use, uh, to work for Bruno for 30 years as our fire chief. So, um, yeah, you, we, we were there. We were lucky. But what I would advise him to do is, because I've worked for a few departments, and every fire department has its own personality. Every city or every jurisdiction, like Nick likes to say, uh, authority having jurisdiction has its own um, culture, personality, and I think he needs to, what I would do if I was a young guy like that, um, is I would think to, to myself, where do I want to live? What part of the country, what part of a state would you want to live in? Maybe look at the benefits of a retirement system where you can move from one department to another and stay in the same retirement system. Um, and then I would go visit fire stations and I would talk to firefighters. I would talk to uh, just regular old firefighters and ask them how things are going around. Just watch them, spend some time with them. And you might get a good sense of, because I don't think firefighters are very shy about uh, talking about some mm -hmm. of the issues that are taking place. And if you visit places and you see that they have um, issues that don't revolve around what we've been talking about is the work the customer service, support of the firefighters, those kind of things, then I'd move to the next department and I would look. Um, it just, it may not be the last place he make, he decides to stay because uh, he sounds like he's a pretty sharp guy. And I think these, these younger individuals, they don't have loyalty like we did to the department. And I don't think they should. I think that's a positive thing. They have loyalty to the position of firefighting to be a firefighter but they're not tied to an organization like kind of some of us uh old heads are right so he could travel around and 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 try one make a decision and then if it's not you know if the last decision he made isn't the last decision he'll make mm -hmm. but i think you got to get out and visit and talk to firefighters and and ask people how they like working in the organizations they're working. He may be surprised with some of the honest answers he gets. You know, <clears throat> here, working here, is uh, there were 25 fire departments that all worked together. So you could, it wasn't unusual for people to start with one fire department and end up with another fire department. So, and I mean, that's... <clears throat> That's kind of the hierarchy of, okay, this is, this is the premier place to work, and then there's these other places that we'll try. And so it was common for uh, people going through the testing process to take multiple tests. And then for a while, they were even combining tests for organizations. And then there was a lot of, uh, for a while, it became a little political because people go to work for other fire departments, and then they would, when they could, they would transfer over to a different fire department. And then that would piss off the fire department they left because that wasn't the first time that had happened. And we put all this time and effort into training you, and now you have this opportunity and you leave us. And, and so that kind of created a thing with the fire chiefs here at the time. And uh, I remember the, the, well, the Phoenix fire chief said, no, the people can work wherever they want, and that's the way this works. And if they're leaving your department to go to work somewhere else, maybe you ought to look inside to why that's happening. 
So yeah, uh, they wanted to charge these people for their turnouts. If mm -hmm. you're going to leave it within a two year period or whatever, and I get it, we, you know, the smaller departments don't want to be the AAA for the larger departments, but but you treat them well in the smaller departments. Yeah. Well, the opposite happened a few years later. Is now there's people leaving the big department oh, yeah. to go to the smaller For, ones. People are going to Frisco, Texas, like crazy. Yeah, because they're paying well. They've got a lot of money, great resources. There you go, so Frisco, Texas. Yeah. I've, well, and the, the other part is, is a lot of places you work now. It's like no, you have uh, indentured servitude. Period. It, is you don't get to go home anymore because of our staffing. Yeah. yeah is you're going to have to. We're going to call you and you're going to work six days in a row. People are like no, I'm not uh, uh goodbye <clears throat> so there's a lot of issues fire departments need to f fix and you hear it it's it, it, more and more common to hear people say we can't test enough people to have quality candidates based on the numbers we're hiring no, and you're like well welcome to the america today that's the way employment works is there's fewer workers and that's the population's dwindling, but the needs of the elderly are expanding. So that includes 911 response. You, you know, what you said is, oh, I hadn't thought of that. A checklist would be nice. Like the things that you that are important and mandatory overtime, if I was a young firefighter, would be on the top of my checklist because that is problematic for a lot of people. Oh, especially if you have a family. Yeah. I, I mean, oh, it's just, yeah, yeah it, it's untenable I for mean, a lot you of can't people. You go to your, you know, the bar mitzvah because, oh, no, we don't have enough people. You have mandatory overtime. So make a list of kind of some of those things, the leadership, safety, how they treat the customer, uh, of course, pay and benefits. But I remember a guy in the, the last department I worked for, and he had a girlfriend girlfriend in Southern California that he wanted, wanted to get serious with. She lived there and he lived here. And uh, he left uh, the Glendale Fire Department to go to a Southern California Fire Department. And within six months, because, I mean, he's going to live on the beach, things are going to be great. And within six months, he came back and his his girlfriend relationship was real strong, and that didn't suffer. But he said, no, I'm not, I can't work for this apartment. They're like, they're just not nice to each other. They don't value all the things that, that Glendale valued. And he was back, and I remember it was kind of a big deal because the fire chief was like, well, do we got to rehire him? And the city manager, I go, no, no, six months, he's coming back. We're just, why would we do that? Why would we put the guy through this? Mm -hmm. well, so we took him back in and mm -hmm. hired him back, and he's happy as can be right now. And it's not uncommon. Uh, we have a house where the instructors stay when they come to Phoenix to do trainers. The next-door neighbor to that house is uh, a, a young couple, and uh, the, 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 the male is a firefighter in L.A. County. And so— he he disappears for a week or two, goes to L.A. to go to work, and then he drives home and he lives in Phoenix. So, I mean, that is a common thing. Hell, when we were young kids, there were L.A. firefighters who owned a plane that lived in Phoenix right. that would fly back and forth. So, I mean, that's firefighters are very ingenuitive people. And so we have been uh, traveling to work for a long time. So that's normal. Gypsies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, so <clears throat> you have a lot of options, especially if you're young. And if you're really qualified, is, is fire departments want to hire you. I mean, so they're it's very competitive for you and you will find a job wherever you want to typically yeah. i mean you you, nick, you have to stay committed to it but i'm and, and you said it nick from the other side if you got people leaving your department get a mirror out and look and see what's happening in your department you got some leaders in there somebody is not being nice because what bruno used to say is people quit their boss not their job and uh mm -hmm. culture right culture is absolutely important but you can tell i've been to departments where you know you visit them and just within about oh, yeah. six hours you go okay this these guys don't even like each other they're or broken just the opposite man these guys are having a wonderful time you can see they look forward to to going to work yeah it, 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 man it's a it's a it's a big country there there's a lot of different ways they're doing it out there <laughs> yeah, and uh, once again, you can get into a state and then move from a, a department, do a few years, see if you like it. And if you don't like it, don't feel committed to that department. Maybe you can stay in the same retirement system and move to another department. If I was 23, 
my advice to Gabe was is exactly what you guys said. Check places out. There's some indicators there. If you can go and talk to people right along. But South Metro Colorado is like a 35 or 45 station fire department. Mm-hmm. They have resources. They have upward mobility. They have different units. And yeah. they seem to be very progressive. So, Big metro. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, there's it, a lot to do there. A lot of stuff going yeah. on. So I, that's Even one small, place I'd Like look. small volunteer places, there's a lot of stuff you can do in them because they rely more on the single like training officer person to do that mm-hmm. stuff. So depending on what it is that you want to do in your career, there's... Minnesota's hiring like crazy right now because there's so many departments transitioning from combination to full career okay. um uh, the bloomington fire department there which is a great fire department just got another safer grant for six and a half million dollars so they're going to be hiring another 16 or mm-hmm. whatever so i mean there, there are opportunities out there at some of these growing places it's kind of fun to get on the on the bottom floor you know when mm-hmm. you're entry level yeah um when when you know these <laughs> places are starting to grow too because there's some are we keeping you? No. <laughs> Good morning, Nick. I, 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 like I pulled a vacuum in part of my brain. It was. Sh- 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 oh, but yeah. there's some cool stuff going on, like you guys said. So I, yeah, I think. No. Uh, Good luck to there. Gabe. But yeah. at least he's asking. Yeah. He's not just going down to the corner and going to the first place that'll yeah. hire him. Sounds like he's probably going to be a pretty good asset out there somewhere. Yeah. So first of all, the great news, we just talked about a little bit about entry into the fire service, right? We got a young guy who wants to enter into the fire service. And we probably remember that everybody, we have a single level entry program in the fire service. It works out really well where everybody comes up from fire firefighter and then they promote to engineer or paramedic and then they get to supervisor level. So most people uh, that are supervisors, everybody knows who they are. They've already developed their own uh, characters, right? People, you, I mean, you're not going to make a supervisor, a fire captain or a lieutenant and do a 180 and just change everything about yourself. You may say you're going to do that and you may do that for a few months, but you're not going to do that. So uh, I think supervisors need to start early in their career uh, developing their character and because I think you, what is it? It's character and performance and relationships. Those are kind of the key areas there. And, um, I think those are the best supervisors who think about it as they're moving up into the system. I think for us, uh, we were fortunate. There's a lot of people in, in our system who, um, the reason we became supervisors is because we didn't want to work for that guy who's taken the test. <laughs> and we were fortunate enough to score high enough on a test that so we didn't want to work for that guy. But we knew that guy. The organization knew that guy. Everybody knew that guy. So we had a department that part of the promotional testing process was not just a written promotional test. Like, unfortunately, in Houston, it's so large with 4,000 firefighters that the promotional tests are pretty much you memorize it and then you go in and you test and the highest score gets moved up. That's very difficult for them. It's hard for them to do what we used to do where you do a written test and then you could do a... <laughs> what are you doing? And I'm citing. Oh, you do a written test and then you could uh, you get interview pro you get interviews and you actually ask the guy questions about leadership scenarios and what his his or her strengths and weaknesses. So that's important. Did I, I think it goes sleep again, Nick. No, oh. it goes back to the kid's question. As you know, the supervisor supports the work. Well, if you want supervisors to do that, the top supervisor in the organization, who's the fire chief, has to have that philosophy and outlook on life. And if they don't, it don't make a shit what you want to do underneath. In a lot of cases, you can do it because you're just going to have more energy, you're going to be closer, and you can outperform the system a little bit. So I, I deal with a lot of officers throughout the course of the year. And some of them work for dysfunctional fire departments, which is normal because the fire chief is more of a policy politician than an operational presence and they all say the same thing especially if they're chiefs they say my battalion my battalion my machine my shift i take care of it so what they've done is they've become the training the operational the personnel everything is that bc is going to reflect what their battalion looks like because everyone 
has abandoned them above for w- any support they need. There's no support to do that within these some of these organizations. So that makes it very challenging. It's really difficult to change the fire department from the bottom or the middle. It's got to come from the top. So if the fire chief, if the union president, if the AHJ are more about keeping the good order and maintaining at certain economic levels, and this is what this looks like, and service delivery is the very last thing on their agenda, uh, I'm going to go back to the young kid's question. I would not go to work in that organization. No. Now, the trap is when, like, you have a fire chief that is that way, and then they leave, because now they can be replaced by some mouth breather that is going to gut it. It, yeah. it, to make it look what they want it to look like. so. And I think you did a really good job of describing the entire system from the top all the way down through the, the firefighter. Mm-hmm. I was kind of focusing a little bit more on the actual supervisor who's who's right there with that worker. And we talk about that, so mm-hmm. how that guy supports that guy at that point in time, right? And that's important, too. Well, and that, and they, could, they could still do that, even without the goofy, yeah. even with the goofy leadership, they can support their members on they, the crew. But it's, but it's, it's almost be like, more difficult. That's like the battalion right. chief, though. Yeah. Is they're like, no, I put up. See, and the problem was when push comes to shove. And see, now that BC's got a problem with one of their captains, one of their company officers. And so they start to process that. Well, now they're kind of going to expand that outside of that BC's power structure. Yeah. So depending on how the other forces come in, the union, the, the BC's boss, the BC's boss's boss, and all how all that congeals, is that can turn into a real shit show in a lot of cases. And then what that does is that sends the message to everybody watching it, when it, it's dysfunctional, that no, don't try to do the right thing here. You got to stick with this checklist of nonsense that's generated by a group of people that have different uh, d- goals than the rest of us do. No, you're absolutely right. You know, and Bruno, it, it's part of the uh, blue card, right? It's part of the instant command piece. Is you got to keep this strategic level, tactical level, mm-hmm. and yeah. task level aligned. And mm-hmm. If it gets out of aligned anywhere in that process. Because I've seen it where, well, we had a great fire chief 30 years. We always talk about that. But we had some knucklehead tactical level bosses when mm-hmm. we were coming up in the system that, oh, my God, thank God Bruno was there at one, at, at one point in my career because I had a tactical boss that wanted to do some goofy stuff. It's like uh, it went up to Bruno. Bruno's like, no, knock it off. So um, it needs to be aligned all the way through the system. You know, but even then, what you just said is is we worked our whole careers with BCs that were not very good at being strategic level uh, managers or tactical level supervisors. They they just didn't have that that competence. They they missed it in their career somehow. And it wasn't until we did, we're going through the recovery after Southwest Supermarkets, and then we standardized the way it, you were going to be an IC on the yeah. fire department. And once we figured out these are the holes that our system has had that we've all grown up with, and we need to fix those, and then we're going to uh, proctor this program in a way that everybody has to do it. And, and that's kind of what happened. So, And I remember incidents in the command van were like at three in the morning your the cell phone would ring and it'd be like a shift commander on another shift and you're like why is he calling me and it's like they're listening to the radio and saying hey man did i just hear the right thing out of battalion five are are they your north division Uh uh-huh why are you calling what is there homework with this (laughs) and they're like no you you guys win but what are you talking about Battalion 5 on B shift just did uh, uh, manage the division beyond their scope of control. They can't, they're not supposed to operate at this level. Well, no, it's the training we've been doing for the last couple of years. I think <laughs> your point is, is well taken is that if you focus on the work as a supervisor and don't get caught up in all the minutia bullcrap and uniforms and the silliness and uh, your ego stays out of the way. If you focus on, like, how did you perform the work? And that's what Bruno, I mean, I'm going back to Bruno all the time. That's what he did best. It's a situation I had. Bruno said, well, what was the outcome? Did It all worked out because I was empowered to do something. But, 
you know, when I was in um, that ocean side, I had the city manager wanted me to write up a firefighter because they took a patient to the hospital in the in the engine company, and I we talked about this before, but it <laughs> should have never happened. No, he saved the the patient's life. The young kid survived because his fire captain made a decision, a very well good decision, but it wasn't lined up with the. And that engine wasn't licensed by the state of Arizona as a transport vehicle. Exactly. How could you do it? Shut the heck. <laughs> and it it worked out well. Tell the family that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. So uh, they can't do They're, the right thing for the cost. So you, the cancer deal, where the the state said uh, cancer for firefighters is occupational. Yeah. The city you worked at here, it, 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 now it's. It comes in, the first firefighter with cancer, it needs your help. What's the first reaction of the city? No. Exactly. When did the city change their mind? When the lawyers and the, and the cameras. And <laughs> the media shows up. And we're going to get all this no, shit. Right. It was the, the young media girl that just. We're going to get it on us and we're going to look bad. So now it's, oh, for us not to look bad, we're going to address this. And now it's it's. Look what we did. Yeah. And you're like, no, you're, you're, you're <clears throat> so, wrong so person in the wrong job. If, if you focus on the work that somebody's doing, and the question was, is how do you support that, that statement of supervisors support the workers? Mm -hmm. Then support the workers with, by helping them do the job they got to do. Not getting in their way. So many supervisors want to get in the way of their workers because they want to show that they're the bosses, right? I want to show you that I'm in charge here, so I'm going to get and hold every. I'm, <laughs> oh, I'm, not going to go I'm taking the captain's test, so I get the nozzle. I order you to give me the nozzle. I'm not, <laughs> you're well, like, I'm not no, that's not. Uh, you're supposed to be. Uh, you got I remember, the. <laughs> I remember walking in. Here's a, here's the one that Bruno helped. I walked into a, a bowling alley. I was a paramedic with another paramedic on a rescue. And a woman is, I think it was a woman, is having a heart attack. A patient. A patient. Yeah, yeah a customer. I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. I'm an old yeah. man. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so I look, and I look down at the patient, and, I, and the other paramedic goes to work with his job of um, uh, getting ready to set up all the equipment. I go over, and I start assessing the patient. I, the little captain there, we could cut that out too. And I said... Uh, uh, he may don't have to say I the said names, you, by he, the way. He may be dead. <laughs> yeah, but it means something to us. Yeah, yeah. Because well, now I've got like seven stories that I'm stacking yeah. and loading them in. Uh, yeah, yeah, man, I'm going ladder Cut 12, them. those <laughs> rotten son of a bitches. <laughs> so, so anyway, here's what happened. So uh, this grip, this fire captain, <laughs> yeah. he says. This uh, off shifter. He says, here's a clipboard, and he puts it right in my face. And it, I'm trying to talk to the lady. And I didn't disregard him. I go, hey, Captain, I'm going to talk to her. And he goes, here's a clipboard when you put it in my face and I said I, I need to talk to the patient she's in she's in trouble I need to talk. take this clipboard I said just a second I need to talk to the patient goes, you better take this clipboard so I took the clipboard out of his hand and I go boom and I dropped it oh. I, and he went ballistic and I treated the patient we all went to the hospital get back there was a battalion chief waiting for me at my fire station, ready to write me up, whatever they want. I mean, they wanted to throw the hammer down because I disrespected his authority. And so we go through the whole process, and hey. it gets to Bruno. <laughs> and what would you do? And I said, I took the clipboard out of his hand like he wanted me to do, and I dropped it on the ground, and I treated the patient. He goes, and what happened? Yeah, it, it, the, what happened after that? Nothing happened. Yeah, exactly. Well, well, no, you know what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what I well, did? You yeah, I, I can tell you what happened is I got even for you. Yeah. Uh -huh, yeah. Well, here's what happened. Uh -huh. <laughs> they, they wrote me up because the battalion chief wanted to write something up. Here's what was actually written up because I just thought of it. Thank you for asking. Terry Garrison will work within the personality of Captain so-and-so. With no Terry Garrison will work within the realms of the personality of Captain So and So. Wow! Oh, that's excellent. That's the best. <laughs> that's the start of a novel. Yeah. That's what he said. Yeah. Uh -huh. I said, okay, yeah. I'll do that <clears throat> because I got ways to do that. Mm -hmm. that did, is, yeah. did you ever? Well, never mind. I'm not no, gonna, no, I'm I not got back go, at him. I, well, yeah, I, I know how you would get back at him. Uh, no, there's I better was ways. His boss later. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. 
but I, I, it wasn't. Oh, he was mean spirited, but I. Yeah, I know. I hear you. I wanted yeah. to be, but yeah, yeah. Uh, just uh-huh. it's so I guess the work. <laughs> I was trying to do the work. Get the hell out of my way so I can do the work. Support the guy doing the work. That's all I had to do. Is say Terry, um, and. No. Anyway, yeah. Well, and part of that work is that basic empowerment that Bruno talks about, right? Empowering Absolutely. the firefighters, yeah, which right. isn't done at a lot of places. Let's let's talk about that empowerment and what yeah. that means. Well, what the captain was trying to do was get you to do his job. That's yeah. all he said. No, you take the form. I don't have to fill it out now, and we're going to leave. That's all he wanted to do was, it was leave. Such a loud bowling alley. I didn't. Yeah. I did, I needed to get down and actually hear what she had to say. But here's the deal with empowerment. Empowerment doesn't come without trust, right? So trust is the big factor in empowerment. There has to be trust, and and I think that's the key. And Bruno trusted us to do the right thing. And and he didn't create, well, how many rules do we have? Ten rules and some, I don't know, not very many. 22, 20 to do and five not to do yeah, or something like go. that. It's one page. I mean, we did an article on them. You could, you yeah. Know, yeah. Well, and, and his quote on that was, uh, God can rule the uh, the earth with 10 commandments. Yeah. We should be able to manage a fire department with 20 rules yeah. or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, yeah. a couple dozen rules. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, We shouldn't need yeah. many more but, than that. But people create rules for every little bitty infraction that occurs, and then a rule comes out, then a rule comes out. Instead of, uh, and you know, here's the difficult part when you have a supervisor who wants to and i've had this as a as a manager and a fire chief it's like well i need to know the rules so i can enforce every one of them mm-hmm. yeah you you ever meet people oh, yeah. like mm-hmm. that yeah. yeah they i want to choke those people uh, not it's to like, use any more names it's- <laughs> so here's the deal why don't you practice leadership and support and communication and then you don't have to know every single rule there is. And it, oh, it's, it's very frustrating. Well, and those are personality types, too, that maybe just that their personality, the way they were raised and their indoctrination to the world, doesn't lend themselves to any leadership role. Because they're, yeah. they're so rigid and so analytical with everything, there's no gray area in their world. They yeah. can't live in that. You know? and, yeah. and, and if there's no gray, I, I find when we do our blue card classes, the, once in a while, we have somebody that doesn't succeed, and they're the people who are so rigid. They want an absolute answer for everything, right. and they don't see that the fire ground's dynamic, just like life in the fire station's dynamic. Right. And there's going to be some gray area sometimes, but they don't line up very well. Yeah, with that. you know, the hazard zone has less gray area, mm-hmm. but in leadership, there's a lot of gray areas where you can, and that gray area is that empowerment card. That's that whole gray area to support the customer. He used to ask the questions on the empowerment card. Is it right for the customer? Is it something you can do with your level? Is it legal, lawful? Nice. Nice. If so, do it. Yeah. And then... See, all fire departments have the same cast of characters. You guys would know. You've worked for... There's the same... 10, 12 people yeah. that, that work there, that make up the fire department. The difference is who's in charge of the different elements of the fire department, basically. So if you got, see, like we knew all the fire chiefs at yeah. the time. You replaced the one fire chief, well, with so far three different fire chiefs in there was a different effect with each one of them, yeah. but they were not as good as the first one, right? Yeah. It just didn't work for whatever reason. So what happens is like you have this deal where you readjust the lineup of who's in charge of shit. And, and so that's going to have an effect on empowerment, on how you do your job, on how people are held accountable or not held uh-huh. accountable for their performance. Mm-hmm. So the goal is, is to get the right people on the fire department and then to get the right asses in the right seats right. to align the thing. 
So, and like you say, you worked with this ladder guy who kept trying to give you the form. Well, that, that, that's fine with the ladder guy. You're, quit send. We need to retrain him or do something with him so he does his job. So, like, the, the top half of the forms at least filled out right. when you guys get it. But so those are easier things to fix because those are just, those are almost like one and done problems. Like, you're not filling the form yeah. out right. And this is what this looks like. So, if the BC, instead of saying no, you, you quit pushing the medic that's doing treatment and just start filling the form out is what he should have done. Yeah. Well, the problem is both with the company officer and then the BC. They're both douchebags, right? <laughs> well, they are. I mean, that's they, yeah, they, they, they shouldn't. Mm. But what happens is, is they have a ceiling that they hit. They can't go do too much damage because above them you have adult supervision. Right. And so what they do is they keep everybody from killing one another, essentially, and they keep us all pointed in the right direction, to use one of your sayings, is we're all looking at the right set of things. We're not looking at a bunch of nonsense that just fills our egos up. So I think that becomes the key in the thing. It, it is, and that's difficult because we don't pick a lot of times. One of the things we were talking about the other day is uh, – like the, 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 the trifecta, AHJ, Fire Chief Union. And they bought up a department that we know the fire chief of. And the city was going to run this guy out because he's very enthusiastic and he, he does a lot of customer-centric stuff. And I think they were just tired of him. And, you know, he always needs help doing it. And But, you know, his heart's in the right place. So he's always going in the right direction. And what happened is, is once it got to a certain level, is the, the local got involved. And the union's like, no, we like him, and he cares for us, and he keeps us pointing in the right direction. He's a little goofy in some ways, but he doesn't want to hurt us. Yeah. And so they got together, and they went to the authority having jurisdiction, and they said, no, you're not getting rid of him. And they didn't. He's still the chief. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. I mean, he was on his way out, and the, the union stood up for him and said, uh-uh, we don't, uh, we, he's our boss. We need him. I think a couple of those people on the board that wanted them gone are no longer there. That's what happens. I mean, that was kind of our whole leadership. That's yeah. how Silverback, you said it, empowerment and trust. And so now those two, the fire chief and the local the, the, and their staffs are, are closer together because oh, of that. And they bonded. The union's got more juice because he's going to give them more running room. They saved his ass. He'll do the same thing for them next. I mean, so that's, you know, that's really kind of what we do is we de-escalate. And, and like it, within is we protect ourselves from outside forces that try to come in and do damage. And they may be well-meaning local authority having jurisdiction, but still it's like, no, you can't. Uh. Uh. It's. It, I think that's the fire chief. That it ain't easy being a fire chief because you got to stand up for the fire department. I don't work for the mayor. I work for the people and the fire department. Sidebar: <clears throat> If you're a fire chief that's negotiating the contract for the fire department, you're in a bad oh, position. No, I no you, man. Oh, you uh, don't. And there are fire chiefs out there that are negotiating on behalf of the city, no. and you've lost the fire department. If you are listening to this right now. <clears throat> And you're in that position, yeah. run, because mm -hmm. it's nowhere you want to be. And that was always uh, because uh, I came from a state where it wasn't uncommon for the fire chief no, to be involved in those negotiations. And I was like, nope, I don't want to <clears throat> have anything to do with that. Now, if, if there's consultation on management rights, you mm -hmm. know, change in shifts, deployment, you know, we've. That's yeah. a discussion for me yeah. to be in, but as far as the working, you know, of how much they're getting paid, they're you know, all the that that's between them and the city. I'm always going to advocate for the firefighters, and and the city manager needs to know that, right? Like I'm here to advocate for them. I'm not here to advocate for the city budget so I can cut money for you. No, yeah. I tell you what. When I went to Houston, I was so blessed because the mayor got it, and she wanted to to do something with the firefighters' pension, and she was hiring me. I was an outside fire chief, the first one they had since 1989. And I said, okay, Mayor, there's a couple questions I had. And one of them is, I, what are conditions, not even questions, because, hey, I was unemployed. I was happy. I was mm -hmm. riding bikes. And I didn't need to go to Houston. I said, I can't. When you talk about the pension and go after the firefighters' pension, I can't be next to you, beside you, behind you, around you. I want nothing to do with that. I said, or else we're not going to be successful doing what she wanted to do, which was actually 
to decrease the loss of life of firefighters. That's what she wants. She goes, I'm tired of firefighters dying. I said, well, I think we can make some progress in that, but I can't do that. And she's like, okay, never did. Next fire chief follows me. That poor guy, I don't know what kind of conversation she had with uh, Mayor Turner, and I can say It was a different here. mayor, yeah. It was a different mayor who, uh, he took that guy, and that, I don't know how you run, I don't know how you do that. Now, there's a city in uh, Chula Vista when I was in Oceanside, and when they enter into a contract, the first thing the firefighters do is they file a no confidence against the fire chief. What? Right off the bat. Wow. Why? Because that's the way they've always done it, oh. and I don't think I don't think no. they're doing that anymore. I'm, I'm talking; it happened. It's factual, but it's ten. Years There's no ago. trust or empowerment there. Yeah. I mean, they they, they have a confrontational ago. relationship for. They, they can't even tell you why at this yeah. point. Mostly, they yeah. like seven fire chiefs ago and three union presidents. Yeah, I'm hoping they they quit doing that a long time ago, but that's the way they were doing it in <laughs> 2009. Well, there's a couple of fire departments we work with that they've ran their fire chief and ops chief and mm-hmm. others out. And, and it's the, the union then kind of reflects on it going, you know, maybe we should stop this because now no, now the candidates that come in aren't really the no. candidates they would want because they mm-hmm. have a reputation. Yeah, it, it's it, when it's you're dysfunctional. A, when you're in a fist fight and you got your head down and you're swinging your arms or something, you're not watching what's going on. Mm-hmm. And and really, what you, fire chiefs and union presidents need to watch the work mm-hmm. and support the work and not fight each other. And I'll tell you what, I think city managers and mayors love it when fire chiefs and union presidents go at each other. Because then they just sit back and they yeah. watch, they watch the wrestling match mm-hmm. and they wait and see who the survivor is and then they go after well, that person. And they if can't they're necessary when they're going after each other. They're the the they're not going after the resources from the city anymore. That's right. Yeah. So it's like no, we can use this and put this over here and do this and we can cut your staffing and we X Y about and Z. The partnership last time and the, yeah, if there's yeah. no partnership. Then the city's like, oh, I'm going to be okay here for the next. Until mm-hmm. they quit arguing, they're not over here. Yeah. The, the, I had a great um, uh, union president when I first got to Houston, uh, Jeff Kanan. Great guy. Second I walked in the door, uh, we started working together. And I think the only way that I lasted the amount of time there on the beginning of that trip was he – he was. He didn't want to fight. Mm-hmm. He's like, I don't want to fight. Let's, you're you're the outside guy. Yeah. I don't like it. I wish we had an inside guy, but you're the outside guy that they picked. So let's work together. And it. I think it. Yeah. We were able to do some things early on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You you get more working together than. Uh, fight, uh, right? Yeah, throwing stuff at each other. Yeah. So hopefully they're not doing that in that Southern California city no more. But uh, oh, that was. When I heard that, I was like, wow, why would you even want to be there? In fact, we know a guy who got the fire chief job there and then decided against it. Yeah, that well, and you hear that. Reason. Yeah, we, we're old enough that we know guys that have gone, to, oh, I got my dream job finally, and three months later you see them, and they're, they don't work there anymore. You think, what happened? It's an, it wasn't a dream job. It was, okay. yeah, they're psychotic. It, it's, it, yeah. I was warned, and I did it anyway. So, you know. <laughs> I thought I'd be the one guy. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's yeah. the other thing is a lot of them think, oh, I'll go in and fix it. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. You guys ready for a timeless tactical truth? Bring on the music. Hell yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tactical truth from Alan Bernasini, pulled from the playing cards that are available at bshifter.com in the store. Woo-hoo. This is the nine of hearts, and it says having a cool head is an important capability for the IC. Having a cool head, an important capability for the IC. We talked about getting the right leaders into place. I guess uh, the ability to remain emotionally under control is one of those, huh? I worked with a, a guy who <laughs> Dick says no. Who knew as much about uh, working on a ladder as anybody in our fire department. And every time you showed up to a working fire with him, he would go batshit crazy. He just couldn't help himself. I, I don't know what it was. He'd overdose on adrenaline or whatever. But he was, <clears throat> he just wouldn't keep it. It's, it's so I think a lot of 
you said it earlier, Vance, is, is there, there's people, it, this guy was like an architect. It's, it, it, well, almost an architect. He was close enough. And, and then he would tell you that about every 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, did you know I was an All-State football <laughs> quarterback? Yeah. <laughs> My name's Art Vandalay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. About every three minutes, pal. <laughs> so, and I think what happens is, uh, is for whatever reason, they just melt down, whatever it is, and, and they, because they have these routines, these very complex ADD-driven routines of how I'm going to conduct myself and, and do this, whatever the, this procedure is that I've made. And then you said it, it is something happens and it derails that and they, they, they lose sight of the critical factors and what they're supposed to be doing there. And then the whole thing, they just like, oh, it's too big to command. They throw their hands up in the air and, <laughs> ah, you know, screaming into the night. And <clears throat> We had a BC who we had a group of BCs when I worked over on the east side, and, and so we had like a new one every eighteen months, and, and they were all you we just wore them out. Oh, and you would just shake your head, and they sent one, and this guy had been uh, a captain paramedic. That was what he was known for, and I mean he's a nice guy, but he wasn't known as a firefighter. He wasn't. He never burned any piece of his gear. I, I mean, he just. In fact, I don't know if his gear was ever even dirty. And so you think, okay, he's coming over. This will be interesting. He was the best IC we ever had that I ever worked for. Cool. He just was. And it's because he was, he, he, he did not emotionally vest himself in that. And he says, no, it's somebody else's emergency, not mine. And he says, this is what we typically, he says, right, this is, you, you put water on it to make the fire go out? And it's, well, yeah, you're the paramedic. Yeah. Boom. So. We got along the best with him, and he wasn't a tactician, but he was the best tactician that we had worked with up to that time. So, And I think his whole deal, it's because he just didn't get – I remember uh, I see him on an ambo once, and he was a captain, and we had a guy, gunshot wound, self-inflicted. The guy stuffed a forty five in the front of his pants and took a step, and then, boom, blew the lefty through his thigh. We get in the back of the ambo, and this guy's he's not doing well. He's starting to fade. Was he in a guard shack? No. Okay, uh, this guy was outside. this was he was he was going into his house. Okay. So it, right. I mean, so you're on the street and and so you're sitting there, and so his partner cuts the guy's pants off, and I remember Dote looks over, he looks at the guy and says, That really looks like it hurts. Oh <laughs> and I thought, man, that was and the guy just kind of went, he was done. He was he was he went away wherever you go when you figure out I blew my junk off. <laughs> so, but, and I remember looking at Dote, and he's looking at me like Mm-hmm. Yeah, that just happened. <laughs> you're like, All right. Yeah, you're. I'll be the ambo guy. You'll be the paramedic. And yeah, but yeah, don't ask me to touch anything back here, pal. <laughs> you know, there's probably a couple reasons why people lose their cool. Some of them lose it. Like I said, they fire for effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they yeah, like yeah. to see what happens. Yeah, I'm a tough you, guy. This yeah, is the way I, I go into it. A, yeah. Yeah, yeah, challenge me now. I yeah, lost yeah. my cool. And then there's the ones who may uh, lose their cool because they're incompetent, right? <laughs> they're uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. They just freeze up in that situation. Mm -hmm. I think those are the two. So one of them needs to be kind of taught out of them. The guy who's maybe disciplined out of them. Mm -hmm. Or don't yeah. lose your cool. And the other one needs to be taught to do their job and build yeah. confidence in the position. And we've seen that um, early when we were doing it. Well, you, you always talk about it with the... Um, when we, we transitioned from the district commanders into the response chiefs, mm -hmm. how those guys got more and more comfortable as a position of an IC after they watched their driver, the yeah. fit of mm -hmm. the raid. Yeah. And a few months later, they were ready to do that. And they, but it, early on, they were uncool sometimes yeah. because they felt uncomfortable. They didn't, they weren't in control of what was happening. And then later on, they they gained the capability to kind of like do the job, and they felt more comfortable about it. You know, and I think part of it is like, you know, doing the work and managing the work and supervising the work. And, and people make it a lot more complicated than it really is sometimes. I so. And I think what happens is people that just aren't as familiar with it see that and they think, no, this is – this isn't what it should be, and it, it, I can't wrap my head around it. And then they watch people who are good at it and think, no, they it, they make it look too easy. And you're like, well, that's because it is. You just have to 
You got to, I don't know, you got to soak a bunch of shit in and then figure out how the cause and effect works. And, and Derek, I don't know, you get to it at some point. Derek, Derek Johnson told me, we love Derek, right? Oh, tremendous human being. He, he said that he told a girl once he was driving and she got a little fast and uh, she, he was driving fast and she got a little scared. And he looked over and he said, hey, babe, just because you're not in control doesn't mean the situation's out of control. <laughs> <laughs> and I was yeah, right. he, he, that is a great yeah. quote. Okay. And you I've know, used, he, he was a great supervisor oh, and yeah, yeah, leader. I've used that on my uh, my wife over the years. And now, she, as I start oh, to boy. say, "Hey, babe, just because you're," uh, she already knows where I'm going. With yeah, it. No, I know. I get yeah. the fu. Yeah, yeah. Do you sleep on the couch yeah. those nights, Terry? I don't negotiate with yeah. alligators, man. Yeah. And they're going to eat you. You just you 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 don't take on the wife. That's it's, sad. it's F well, around and yeah, find, yeah, find out. out. Yeah, yeah. No, that's it, baby. <laughs> but that's how I know how deal. this one's going to end. <laughs> so some of those people with that lose control too. They're not. They just don't understand everything that's happening at that point. And they lose their. They kind of lose their mind. You know, it's really not worth it. Losing control. No. no, no I, I no. mean, you get jacked you, up over certain things. That, you know, we've all lost control at times. And, and you're like, why did I even care about any of this? This is just ridiculous. There was a guy that I worked with that. You could tell when he hailed dispatch whether it was going to be a working fire or not. Oh, no. Oh, he'd, he'd call, County Fire 441. It's like, okay, this is a working uh, fire. Well, it gets up. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, you know, like before he even got the size up out. So then my goal was, <laughs> I, I was, you weren't going to know it was a working fire until I got to the point in yeah. time where I'm saying, and this is a work. And, and I, I was blowing people away after that because they're like, I didn't know it was a working fire until you said it was working. Right. Your voice sounded the same as it normally does. His, like, he well, always had a healing. Yeah. <laughs> we got a fire. Fire. Yeah. Hey, sometimes I'd yawn before I'd ask for a second. Uh, yeah. 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 Get set a say alarm now. My wife rode with me one time. Uh, we were, she came by to drop something off and we had a, a bee call. Bees out here kill people, mm -hmm. right? They oh, yeah. Killer bees. bees. Yeah. Killer bees. We don't need those stick and patches. <laughs> and uh, she wanted to ride with me on the engine. So, And she never did that because she did, wasn't too thrilled about my job. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, Nick took command. Uh, we're on the incident. We're on the scene of an incident, and we have a large bee attacking uh, everybody be careful. <laughs> to this day, my wife goes, he's nuts. And I go, yeah. did you just? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, they gave him an open tactical channel to share with the world, him. baby. Yeah. Be yeah. careful. Yeah. Uh -huh. That was cool command. Yeah, yeah. that was very cool yeah. command. Yeah. Uh -huh. we were so, way, sometimes we were too cool. <laughs> what are you going to do with cool command? What are we going to do with it? Yep. When the leadership part's done, we're going to publish the book behind Maybe that's it. that's a good way to finalize this. That yeah. was my favorite part of Bruno coming to class uh, was when he would do the cool, cool command. Because I think it's it's necessary for ICs to understand how much the the way that they project will affect everybody else. I have it scene. on my desk, and I was just looking at it before we were coming in here. I was going mm -hmm. through some documents, mm -hmm. and I saw the cool command folder. Mm -hmm. and I was going through that. It's like, oh, this is great. Yeah, it's, it's all it's like, it's like senior advisor stuff. Well, it's I, I see stuff, but if you're a senior advisor, that means you train ICs. Okay. So that is kind of the... You teach and, them the skills. Exactly. And this whole silverback thing is really designed for a fire department. Now, it's going to work across the board in other occupations. It really will. But we're focused for the fire department, and that's what it's going to be for. So it will support blue card and that whole process. And then, like I say, there will be other industries that will tap that, I think, at some point. But, yeah. Soon. Yeah. So Soon. I I – probably a year before the silverback's done. And then cool commands basically written. It's just us uh, getting it yeah, desktop published and then putting the book out. Well, that wraps up this B shifter podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll uh, see you next time. Thanks guys.